All right, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, this is, uh, it's, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, so uh, I am a philosopher of science, and I like to think a lot about um, how scientists reconstruct uh, the deep past. And I like to think a lot about uh, fossils and landscapes. And this image here, see if I can, that's a, a photograph um, that I took in um, Canada, in Dinosaur Provincial Park in uh, um, uh, Alberta, Canada, a few years ago. Um, and it's a really, um, well, I'll say a little bit more about the, um, the image as we go along. Um, my big idea today is that knowing something's history makes a difference to how we experience it. Um, and I'm going to argue that this has, this is a really important idea for understanding how um, science works, how geology and paleontology uh, works. And I'm going to try to um, make this case with a few examples. Um, so we're going to start with salads. <laughs> Just thinking about um, sort of the theme of disarray. When I think of disarray, I think about Landsca some landscapes, badland landscapes, like the image I just showed you, but also, I don't know, salad, salad disarray. Um, so imagine uh, that you've got two salads on the table in front of you, and um, they're indistinguishable. Um, they look the same, they taste the same, uh, you couldn't, you know, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them. We might say uh, philosophically they're qualitatively identical. Um, but suppose I, I tell you something about um, the first salad, and I tell you that um, it's made from greens and um, yummy fresh veggies grown by uh, students here at the Connecticut College Sprout Garden sustainably um, uh, and, you know, in the most wonderful way. It's, you know, um, uh, uh, with vegetables from our local um, community, campus community. And suppose I um, tell you that the uh, second salad um, is made from uh, materials that are shipped from far away, uh, grown with pesticides, harvested by exploited workers. Um, this, this information, this knowledge about where um, these things came from might affect uh, your aesthetic experience of the salad. How the meal is gonna taste to you is gonna be impacted by your knowledge of its history, of its past. Um, so how the salad tastes, your aesthetic experience of it, how you engage with it aesthetically is affected by what you know about its history. Um, learning about that history uh, could make the salad taste better, and this is important. It could also make the salad taste worse. Either way, uh, there's a sense in which your aesthetic engagement with your meal is improved by knowing where it came from. And there's a a really important issue here that I want to highlight. Um, I actually, it might sound a little bit counterintuitive, but I actually think that um, learning where your salad came from uh, might, in a sense, improve your aesthetic engagement with it, even if it makes the salad taste worse, or even if it makes you value um, your meal a little bit less. Um, great, okay, so to um, add a couple more examples, this is a, a famous example from a classic paper in environmental ethics by this guy, uh, Robert Elliott, um, who asks us, to Im imagine two paintings. Um, they're both Vermeers. They look exactly alike. Uh, even, um, you know, art experts can't, can't tell the difference. Um, but suppose we learn um, that one of them is an authentic original Vermeer painted in the 1660s, uh, and the other one is the product of a master forger, a virtuoso who's just um, extremely skilled at duplicating paintings. Now, this is another kind of case where I think your knowledge of where the painting came from is going to affect your aesthetic engagement with it. Um, we might, I mean, you might have the intuition that uh, the original Vermeer is more valuable uh, than the forgery. And that something might be right about that. I actually think you might also admire the forgery. <laughs> if the forgery is that good, uh, you might think, well, the skill that it would take um, to actually produce something like that is so, you know, so incredible. Uh, that you might, you, know, might, you might value the forgery very highly as well, um, but you're going to value it differently. Uh, you're going to engage with those two paintings differently depending on what you think about them, what you know about, about where they came from. So now to, to switch up examples again and think a little bit more about um, science. Um, 
this is like my favorite fossil. Um, these guys, uh, so this is a, a Mesozoic ammonoid, and these guys um, are marine invertebrates that swam around in the oceans during the time of the dinosaurs. They've been extinct for many millions of years. Um, and they had these cool coiled shells, and th their closest relatives today are probably chambered nautiluses. Um, their fossils are really abundant. You can find them all over the place. Uh, this is a nice uh, image of one uh, photograph that I took in a museum at one point. And um, <coughs> it turns out, you know, people, people in Europe, for example, have known about these for a long time. Uh, people collected them, um, and originally, uh, if you go back to sort of medieval Renaissance, early modern Europe, it was um, pretty common to call these snake stones. Uh, I mean, they kind of look like snakes. Uh, the, the original sort of thought was that these actually were uh, petrified snakes. Um, you you know, might have heard stories about like early Christian saints showing up in some new place and like getting rid of all the snakes, you know, St. Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland, that sort of thing. So the idea is some, some saint or holy person shows up and like shazam, and all the snakes turn to stone, and then that's what you get. And people were so, um, found this sort of narrative so compelling that they actually, there are a lot of cases where they would doctor the fossils to make them, to, you know, put little faces on them, because <laughs> they were just sure uh, that they were the remains of snakes. And the, the suggestion I want to make about this case is that when you have um, a mistaken belief about something's history, um, you're, you're confused. Uh, you, you misunderstand where it came from. There's an important way in which that undermines your aesthetic engagement with the item. Um, not that you can't have any valuable aesthetic engagement with a thing, even if you're confused about it, um, but the suggestion is um, we're better off um, in terms of just appreciating what these things were if we have some understanding of where they came from. Uh, to make this a little bit more real, um, I'll just, I, there, I, I could easily take my whole 18 minutes talking about the fossils and like how cool they are. Um, these, these things were, they had an organ called a siphuncle that ran through each chamber and it was like an air exchanger so they could, they could, um, uh, pump air into each chamber and pump it out and control their buoyancy and they could move up and down the water column like submarine. I'm like, this, this is like amazing stuff. Uh, really biologically interesting. Um, and, and if you think it's a petrified snake, you're, there's so much that you're missing. You're not really, you're not really appreciating. Okay, um, to give a more environmental example, uh, this is an image I took. Um, it's actually from our, my town where I live here in Connecticut. Um, you can find these wolf trees all around the woods um, in southern New England. Um, and what this is, is um, it's an old, I guess maybe an oak tree or something that was originally growing up in some farmer's pasture. Um, so when this tree was young and growing up, there was nothing else around it, uh, and its branches spread laterally, you know, to catch the sunlight. Um, farmland gets abandoned, uh, and um, the land reverts to woods, as happens with lots of our landscape around here in, in Connecticut. And um, in more recent decades, you get all these kind of younger maples and stuff kind of growing, fast-growing trees kind of growing up through um, the old wolf tree. And if you know, if you, it's kind of an, just a small history of a landscape, but it's kind of amazing. Um, and if you, if you are familiar with that history of sort of human occupation of the land and then reversion of the land to what you might think of as a more natural condition, um, it really helps you connect with the place when, you, when you're walking. <laughs> and, you know, um, you ha if you have some understanding of what you're seeing and what you're experiencing, I think it um, gives you a deeper connection to the place. So on the one hand, um, being confused about where things came from can undermine our aesthetic engagement with those things. But actually knowing something about where they came from or how they came about can enrich our aesthetic engagement uh, with the world around us. Okay, so now back to the Badlands. This is a, I'm gonna sort of um, leave you with a thought experiment. In philosophy, we love to do thought experiments. So I'll leave you with a thought experiment today. Um, this is a nice image of, um, this is the Red Deer River that flows through Dinosaur Provincial Park in Canada, and it's all around it on both sides. You've got these like uh, cool erosional Badlands with 
you know, it's, it's one of these amazing parts of the world. You can walk around and there's dinosaur bones all over the place weathering out and stuff. Um, and I want to um, imagine uh, three uh, people just getting beamed down into the Badlands, um, but, but bringing different perspectives. Okay, so <clears throat> we're back to this original image. Um, so to start with, imagine one of these three people is a young Earth creationist, and they're just sort of confused about what they're seeing. They think this landscape is a few thousand years old. They see something like that. That's a clamshell in the middle of, you know, like the eastern Alberta prairie. Um, they see something like that weathering out of the ground and uh, think, well, you know, maybe it was washed in by the flood or something like that. They've got some sort of sort of confused picture about how the landscape came about. Um, next, uh, imagine that um, the second visitor to the landscape is a geologist or, or someone who, who has some understanding of the history of the place. And the history is like amazing. <laughs> um, if you could go back, I don't know, 68, 70 million years ago or so, um, the entire landscape was a coastal plain. In the late Cretaceous, you know, there's this big interior seaway that runs, you know, ran north-south um, right through the center of North America. Um, uh, and in this part of Western Canada, you would have been right near um, the seashore, actually. And it would have been wooded, it would have been pretty lush, there would have been big dinosaurs running around, little dinosaurs too, uh, running around the landscape. And you would have these big, wide um, coastal rivers kind of uh, meandering down the coastal plain to the... Uh, to the shoreline, and in the bends of these rivers, you would have um, clam beds, freshwater clam beds, um, and that's what you're kind of, when you go to the, to the site today, you walk around and there's clamshells everywhere, you're basically kind of walking around on the fossilized remains of an old uh, clam bed that would have been in the bend of a river. Um, so imagine that our, our second visitor to the place like knows all that, all right? Now imagine that the third visitor is a willfully uninformed romantic. So I've already said a bit about how like confusion about the past might undermine aesthetic engagement and about how knowledge of the past could enrich it. But what about somebody who says, well, science tends to lead to disenchantment. <laughs> you know, knowing, if you know about the landscape, it loses its mystery, it loses its, um, you know, it's less captivating. Um, you know, less engaging or intriguing. Um, so imagine someone who says, I, don't, I just, I'm not interested in that. Um, I just want to go walk around, take things in, and marvel. And say, I don't know, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and that's okay. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to appreciate it and enjoy it. Um, and experience it and not, you know, not do the cognitive work of trying to figure out where it came from. So, the thought I want to leave you with is that of these three people, um, the person who's really best off aesthetically in their engagement with the landscape is the scientist, the, the geologist. And I want to say a bit about why I don't think um, the willfully um, uninformed romantic is really in the best situation here. So here's a, here's a proposal or a bit of an argument. Um, I, this thought experiment that I just asked you to imagine, you know, three people beamed into the Badlands. I think it's a lot like um, imagining someone who's headed to go experience a symphony, right? And um, they're stuck in traffic. They don't, uh, they don't get there until the last couple of minutes of the performance, maybe the last minute of the performance. And so they, they experience the closing bars of the symphony, and that's it, right? That's it. Um, the, you know, the, the geologist is in a situation rather like the person who experiences those closing bars of the symphony, but has some understanding of the larger piece. Maybe not perfect understanding, but they have some understanding of the context and the larger, um, you know, the larger composition. The willfully uninformed romantic arrives late, basks in those, like, final chords, <laughs> and that's it. You know, that's the entire aesthetic experience. I think that's um, uh, somewhat impoverished. And I, um, I think it's, um, 
in a way, I think what's going on is there's a, a confusion even about the, the appropriate object of aesthetic engagement. Um, you're not just engaging with the snapshot at the end, <laughs> with the, you know, the image that I showed you a moment ago of the clamshell that you can see today, or the closing chord in the symphony or whatever. Um, it's really the larger historical process that's the appropriate object of aesthetic engagement. And it's really the scientist with some knowledge of the past that um, is best positioned, I think, to, to appreciate that. Okay, so we, we philosophers like arguments, so I'll leave you with an argument <laughs> in premise conclusion form. Uh, so knowledge of the past uh, deepens and improves our aesthetic engagement with fossils and landscapes. Uh, the paleoscientists, so think of that broadly as including geology, paleontology, evolutionary biology. Uh, the paleoscientists teach us a lot about the history of fossils and landscapes. Uh, therefore, the paleoscientists contribute to better aesthetic engagement. Right. Thanks. <laughs>